In this lesson, I just want to give you a brief introduction to contract law and really the only goal here is to try to understand from a big picture what the flow of a typical contract law analysis looks like. So don't worry about any of the concepts you see up here on the board, statute of frauds, parole evidence rule. We don't care about the substantive law aspect of any of these concepts. We're going to dive into a ton of detail in all of these areas. Trust me, we'll get there in future videos. Right now, all we care about is the flow of the analysis from a big picture perspective. This is going to be critical, right? If we can understand the big picture, it's going to help us out a ton when it comes to issue spotting fact patterns. So, and when we get into future videos, right, I'm always going to refresh this big picture idea, this flow of formation, performance, and remedies. We're always going to come back to it. So if you don't fully grasp everything here, no problem. We're going to keep talking about this as a theme in all of our videos. But to get started, right, in short, what is contract law? Contract law is simply a mechanism that we use to enforce agreements or a set of promises between usually two people, right? So imagine that I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. You accept, you hand me a crisp $5 bill, but I fail to deliver you this dry erase marker. Well, we had an agreement, right? We had a set of promises. You promised to give me $5 in exchange. I promised to give you this dry erase marker. And you held up your end of the deal. You gave me $5, but I broke my promise to you. I never delivered the dry erase marker. Contract law simply explores whether you as the plaintiff can enforce these promises or enforce this agreement in court. Are you entitled to remedies for my failure, for my broken promise of delivering the dry erase marker. Can you get your $5 back? Can you get a new replacement dry erase marker? You know, are you entitled to some type of remedy for that broken promise, right? That's what contract law is exploring. That's in a nutshell, what all of your fact patterns are going to look like. Right now, they're going to be more complicated than that. But in short, right, that's the idea here. So really, contract law, rather than calling it contract law, sometimes I like to think of it as enforceable agreements because yeah, the traditional enforceable contract is the main way that we enforce an agreement for between two people, but it's important to recognize from the outset that there's lots of ways to enforce promises, to enforce agreements between people. Yeah, we have the contract, the traditional enforceable contract that we're mainly talking about, but we also have all these alternative legal theories. We have things like promissory estoppel, the quasi-contract, a moral obligation plus a subsequent promise. So it's important to recognize from the very beginning, right? Contract law should really be called enforceable agreements, right? Because the traditional enforceable contract is one way, and this is what we're going to spend 90% of our time talking about. In law school, this is what you spend almost all of your time talking about. On the bar exam, this is what's primarily tested. But we do also study these alternative ways you can enforce an agreement. So a lot of times I hear professors and instructors and students using the word contract very interchangeably. And it's maybe not necessarily wrong to refer to these alternative theories as contracts, but I think it can be confusing, right? So in our heads, we want to break this up. So when we're trying to decide on a contract's fact pattern, whether we can enforce an agreement between two people, we want to say, okay, our default standard is the traditional enforceable contract, mutual assent, consideration, defenses, statute of frauds, right? That's our default, the traditional enforceable contract. But we don't want to forget about alternative theories, even if we don't have a traditional enforceable contract. Maybe we didn't have mutual assent. Maybe we didn't have consideration. Maybe there's there's some sort of defense that might invalidate the contract. Maybe it didn't satisfy the statute of frauds. Whatever reason, we don't have a traditional enforceable contract. That doesn't mean that it's impossible for the plaintiff to recover remedies. Plaintiff could still recover under an alternative legal theory like promissory estoppel, quasi-contract, or a moral obligation. Imagine that I offer to give you this dry erase marker for free and you accept but I never deliver this dry erase marker. Well, there's no consideration there, and don't worry about what consideration mutual sent. Take my word for it, right? There's no consideration there. That's just a promise to give you a gift. 
So that's never going to be a traditional enforceable contract. But if you relied on that promise to your detriment, you might be able to recover under one of these alternative legal theories like promissory estoppel, right? So the idea here from a policy perspective is we have the default traditional enforceable contract and this is what we always want to look at first. But the courts say sometimes even if you don't have a traditional enforceable contract to prevent unjust outcomes in the sake of fairness and equity, we might allow you to still recover damages even though you didn't have the traditional contract under one of these alternative theories. And this is how we come up with promissory estoppel, quasi contracts, you know, unjust enrichment, moral obligations. All of these alternative theories are rooted in ideas of equity and fairness. Okay. So from the beginning, the first thing we want to do, right? We're looking at our contract law fact pattern. We're trying to decide whether we can enforce an agreement or a set of promises between two people. Number one, first question has to be, do we have the formation of a traditional enforceable contract? If we don't, is there an alternative theory that's at play, right? Because there's more than just one way to enforce an agreement between two people. We have the traditional and we have alternative, right? But if we decide that in fact we do have a traditional enforceable contract, we have mutual sin consideration, there's no defenses that invalidate the contract and the statute of frauds is either not triggered or it's satisfied. Basically, we have a traditional enforceable contract, legit. It's formed or the fact pattern just stipulates that you do. Sometimes a fact pattern will tell you, look, you have an enforceable contract. It gives it to you. It stipulates it in the facts. Next question is going to be, okay, we have a traditional enforceable contract. Just because we have a traditional enforceable contract, that doesn't mean that the plaintiff's entitled to remedies. There's still this big question of performance. Was the traditional enforceable contract performed? If both sides perform, then there's no breach, which means no remedies, right? So imagine in our example, I offer to give you this dry erase, I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. You accept, I give you the dry erase marker and you give me the $5. Well, we had a traditional enforceable contract, mutual assent, consideration, let's say there's no defenses that invalidate it, satisfies the statute of frauds. So we have a traditional enforceable contract. I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. You accept, you pay me $5, I give you the dry erase marker. Okay, so we have a traditional enforceable contract, but both sides, you and I, have both performed our duties under the contract. So there's no breach. So no one's entitled to remedies. No plaintiff here could sue and recover any remedies because we both performed our duties under the contract. Now let's say, same fact pattern that I offer to sell you this dry erase marker for $5. You accept, you hand me the crisp $5 bill, but when I hand you the dry erase marker, you take it, you go to write on the board with your dry erase marker that I've just given you for $5, and you're going, you're going, it has no ink. It's completely worthless, right? Well, in that case, did I, sorry about that, in that case, did I perform, right? You obviously performed, you handed me $5, but did I perform on my end, right? And that's something that performance will explore, right? Promised you a dry erase marker. Is there some sort of guarantee that the dry erase marker would actually work, right? And those are issues that we would discuss here under performance. But don't worry about actually solving that or coming to a conclusion there. We'll get into all of that when we talk about these issues under performance. But the, to end the analysis, right, to understand the flow, if we decide, okay, we have a traditional enforceable contract and we know that one side has failed to perform their duties under the contract. So we have a traditional contract, one side has failed to perform, that side who failed to perform their duties under the contract is in breach. That means the plaintiff is entitled to remedies, right? And we have monetary damages and equitable relief. And you will go through that depending on what the call of the question is. We'll talk a lot about remedies when we get there. Also, there's this idea that the plaintiff has the duty to mitigate damages. Again, don't worry about that now. We'll get there when we talk about remedies. The main point to understand now though is this is a three-step analysis. Number one, 
Do we have a contract? If so, was the contract performed? If one side failed to perform, that party is in breach. What remedies are available to the plaintiff? Okay, it's that easy. It's a three-step analysis. So no matter where you are on a contract law fact pattern, right? 95% of the time, there's a couple issues that might not fall anywhere that on this board, but that's very rare and we'll talk about that completely separately. But for our purposes, almost every issue you're ever going to encounter on a contract law fact pattern is going to fall somewhere on this board, right? And it's going to be your job, and we're going to work on this together as we go through future videos, but it's going to be your job to establish where you are in the analysis. Where are we in the flow? We could be at the beginning, we could be at the middle, we could be at the end. The call of the question is going to give you a lot of clues, right? If the call of the question asks whether there was a breach of contract, right? Breach of contract. This is your call of the question. Well, you know that we're not talking about alternative legal theories, right? Breach of contract is referring to the traditional enforceable contract. So you can basically draw an X through all of these issues because promissory estoppel, quasi-contract, moral obligations, none of that stuff is an actual breach of contract, right? So if you're trying to decide breach of contract, you know you're going formation, performance, and remedies, right? But sometimes the call of the question or the fact pattern could give you that you have a traditional enforceable contract. If the call of the question asks whether there's a breach of the contract and the facts stipulate that you have a traditional enforceable contract, all that's left to discuss is, rem is performance and remedies, right? Did both sides perform their duties under the contract, right? And so we'll get into all of this in a lot of detail and the different combinations, but I'm just trying to illustrate right now that how the, this works, right? How you take the call of the question and try to identify where you are. Are we in formation? Are we in performance? Are we in remedies? Are alternative theories at play or are they not? If the call of the question is only asking about a breach of contract, alternative theories are out. However, if the call of the question says, can the plaintiff recover or is plaintiff entitled to damages, is plaintiff entitled to remedies, right? If that's your call of the question, then alternative theories are at play, right? Or if this asks, is there any theory of enforcement that the plaintiff can recover under? Well, then you have to discuss all of this, right? Well, number one, we have the traditional enforceable contract. That's the main way. But if it's asking whether P is entitled to remedies, that doesn't narrow out any of these alternative theories as well. So again, you have to look at the call of the question. You have to look at where you are in your analysis. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit different for multiple choice and essays. And we're going to go into all of this as we continue and we start really breaking down examples. But right now, the main idea is just to try to understand the big picture, the flow. And remember, usually we're always trying to get at whether you can enforce an agreement. So you're going to fall somewhere in this if you're trying to decide whether an agreement can be enforced. It's your job as step one going to be to determine where we are in that flow. The last thing I'll leave you with here is just some issue spotting checklist stuff. And don't worry, I just want to give you some quick mnemonics acronyms, and this will be in the handout below. But just some quick mnemonics here that I like to use. Again, this is all cat-based. For those of you that know, if you watch the YouTube videos, you probably see my cats in the background running around. So I like to use lots of cat acronyms, right? So for formation, the big four issues we want to think about, mutual assent, consideration, defenses to formation, and the statute of frauds, I use the acronym My Cats Do Sneak. My Cats Do Sneak, right? So if you identify on your contract law fact pattern that there's a formation issue, you always wanna run through that acronym real quick. My Cats Do Sneak, mutual assent, consideration, defenses, and the statute of frauds, right? Alternative theories, if you're looking and you're, and you're like, okay, we don't have a traditional enforceable contract, but I'm trying to find if the plaintiff has any theory of recovery, I want to think about alternative legal theories. The big three are going to be promissory estoppel, quasi-contract, or unjust enrichment, and moral obligations, right? I use pouncing, quells, mice, right? Cats pounce on mice to attack them, right? Pouncing, quells, 
MICE, promissory estoppel, quasi-contract, and moral obligations plus subsequent promises. Right, so that's our big ones there as far as acronyms. Finally, for performance, right, we have, if we're moving on into the flow, we have a traditional enforceable contract. Our next question is whether that traditional enforceable contract was performed. I like to use the acronym Sarah Plays With Cats Every Afternoon. Substantial performance versus perfect tender, which we'll get into in a future video. The parole evidence rule, warranties, conditions, excuses, and anticipatory repudiation, right? So if you get to performance and you're like, is there performance here? Did both sides perform? And you're looking for a checklist to think about all the main issues. Sarah plays with cats every afternoon. We have this idea of substantial performance versus perfect tender, the parole evidence rule, warranties, conditions, excuses, and anticipatory repudiation. Finally, remedies. Really easy to remember, right? You don't even need an acronym there. It's either going to be monetary damages or equitable relief. And we have this idea of mitigation of damages. You can think of MIM, right? M, M, E, M. If you want an acronym, you can do MIM. But again, that's very easy. If you get to remedies, it's mostly at that point just going to be calculating and we'll get there when we get to remedies. But it's monetary damages and equitable relief are your main two types of remedies. And then we have this idea of mitigation of damages. Plaintiff has a duty to mitigate. But we'll get there in future videos. With that, guys, though, I'll leave you to it. We just have a few more general principles to go over. In our next video, we'll talk about the two universes of contract law, the UCC versus the common law, which is going to be really important. Don't want to skip that video. But after that, we're going to be ready to jump into formation. We'll get into mutual assent, how you determine whether a traditional enforceable contract was formed. But until then, guys, I'll leave you to it and I'll see you at our next video. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. 
I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Sudicata video lectures throughout my law school career, and I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.